Thanks for listening to the Suzy Larson Life Podcast, available thanks to support from listeners like you. It's only just a matter of Welcome to Suzy Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. Well, here's something I've pondered at length the last several years especially. Is there a common denominator found in those who finish well? Is there a common denominator found in those who finish well? Well, how about in those that don't? Honestly, I think there is. I think it's the difference between those who fear God and those who don't. My guest today writes this, what if you were told of a hidden virtue that in essence is the key to all of life? It unlocks the purpose of your existence and attracts the presence, protection, and provision of your creator. It's the root of all noble character and the foundation of all happiness and provides needed adjustments to all inharmonious circumstances you may face. Guess who joins us today? John Bevere, one of my favorites. I've just esteemed and respected him for so long. He's back to talk about his book, The Awe of God, The Astounding Way a Healthy Fear of God Transforms Your Life. This is a best-selling book back when he was on when it first released. I predicted it, but I wasn't the only one. Uh, but it it just flew off the shelf because people are hungry and thirsty for not only an encounter with God, but for a right view of God. And so we are really praying today that you get, you just experience a tangible sense of God's presence, that he brings correction and direction and confirmation to some of the things that you may be wondering about. Got a handful of copies of this really important book to give away, The Awe of God. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. Quick announcement before we hear from John. If you've not checked out our free app in the App Store, you got to do it because we've got listeners from over 170 countries who listen online. Isn't that amazing? So if you're traveling this season, maybe you listen by way of radio, but when you travel, you, we're not in your terrestrial area, well, you can get the app for free. Go to the App Store, look Faith Radio Network, and you'll find it. All right, now, let me tell you about my guest. We'll get him on the show. John Bevere is a minister known for his bold, uncompromising approach to God's Word. He's also an international best-selling author who's written more than 20 books that have collectively sold millions of copies and have been translated into 129 languages, along with his wife, Lisa, who was just on last week. It's the Bevere Month because Addison's coming up soon to as well, excuse me, John is co-founder of Messenger International, a ministry committed to revolutionizing global discipleship. When John is home in Franklin, Tennessee, you'll find him loving on his grandbabies, playing pickleball, or trying to convince his beautiful wife, Lisa, to take up golf. Mr. John Bevere, we sure love you. Welcome back to the show. Susie, what an honor it is to be on with you. And I have the utmost respect for you. So it's very mutual. I mm-hmm. think we're we're in our mutual fan club. I just I've just watched God use you to impact our nation in such a profound way. And I just want to thank you so much for being consistent, mm-hmm. for loving Jesus, loving people, and loving truth the way you have done for years. And so wow. it is a great honor for me to be on this program with you today. Wow. You know, you, I'm telling you what, (laughs) Lisa gave me a similar gift when she was on last week. There's something about, um, I always say honors the equity of the kingdom. I just think there's something to that, but I can't thank you enough for saying that. And I, I, I feel the same and say the same about you, John and and your son, Addison, you know, he he was up till his schedule really picked up. He was on once a month with us. So after Lisa came on, after a stretch of Addison, I said, hey, you're Addison's mom. <laughs> and she's like, I'll take that label any day. But we just love your family so much. So it means the world. That's a new one. I'm busy. used to be calling Lisa Bevere's husband. So that's a new That's one. right. Lisa yeah, Bevere's you're mom. Addison's dad. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say that to her when I see her tonight after all our Oh, there you stuff. go. She might slug you, but she took it from me. So oh, <laughs> love you it. might pull out a knife on me. I'm only yeah. <laughs> Please, everybody, I'm only joking, but yeah. It's yeah, Monday totally. Tuesday. No emails. Thank you. We're, co- we're coming yeah. up on 42 years this October, so I'd marry you tomorrow wow. in a heartbeat if I could. Wow. So great. Well, I love what God's done through your family. And it is fun for me to have three Bevere's on in the same month, so that's pretty awesome. Well, you know this because you've been on before, but my question that I ask first and foremost is the same every day. And it's just this, what's the Lord been impressing upon your heart as you've been spending time with them these days? 
Okay, I'm gonna have to put put a put a PS on it. Holiness. I hmm. I just downloaded I downloaded a book on Audible on holiness. I downloaded on my Kindle on holiness. I have such a desire for holiness. Now there is a reason. And um, you know, I, I wish I could find it. I wish I I wasn't ready for this question, but I believe it was um I believe it was C.S. Lewis that says anybody who thinks holiness is dull hasn't met the real thing. When you meet mm -hmm. true holiness, you meet the irresistible. And I just cannot get enough. Now, I, with that being said, I was not brought up with any kind of a holiness background. I wasn't brought, I was brought up in the Catholic Church. And I found Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior in my college fraternity. And I immediately, you know, began a life, a journey with him that my love and my desire for his truth is more passionate today than it was 45 years ago when I met him in that fraternity. And so um, I feel like, you know, my kids still say, Dad, you're cool. My grandkids think I'm cool. So obviously, holiness has not dulled me or made me boring. But what it has done is given me a much more of a vibrant relationship with the Lord. And I know that's what everybody's crying out for. And, you know, one entire section of this book in the awe of God is devoted to holiness. But I find the Holy Spirit is drawing me into this section and actually to amplify it even more this year. So that is a very long yeah. answer to your one simple question. Love it. No, it's perfect. I don't know if you've read any of Francis Frangipane's work, but he's got an old one that I read years ago, Holiness, Truth, and the Presence of God. It's uh, If you're in a, you know, a mode of reading books on holiness, that's a good one. I just remember I that. I but... threw it in my suitcase when I went to the Dominican Republic last week. Okay. I, okay. I am reading Mercy Sproles right now, and I'm just like, can't get enough. I am, you that's know, so good. You, look at, you look at the angels, and they're, you know, when Isaiah sees the Lord, when John the Revelator sees the throne of God, and the angels are crying, holy, holy, holy. Now, um, some say, most say it's a song. It's not a song. They're, they're, it's actually a, a Hebrew form of writing. Whenever the Hebrews would want to emphasize a word, you know, we what we do today in English is we italicize the word, we boldface it, we use an exclamation point. Hebrews would write it twice. If you, if you look at Matthew 7, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom. Jesus doesn't have a speech impediment. If you're Matthew and you're sitting listening to Jesus, Jesus goes, not everybody who says to me, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew goes, oh, my gosh, I've got to, I've got to emphasize that. I've got to write it twice. Very few times, I think it only happens four or five times in the Bible, does a Hebrew writer elevate a word to the third degree to elevate a word to the third degree means they can't emphasize it anymore. And Hebrews were extremely careful with words because they knew the power of communication. Well, an example would be when the angels in the book of Revelations are flying over the earth, they go, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants on the earth, right? Well, the only place that you find uh, God's attribute being elevated to the third degree is Isaiah 6 and, and Revelation 6. When John sees the throne and Isaiah sees the throne, and they are crying holy so loud. They're shaking a building in heaven that seats over a billion beings to its foundations. They're shaking the doorposts, which is the most stable part of a structure. And so these angels aren't singing a song to God. They're responding to what they see. Every moment, another facet of his greatness is being revealed to them. And all they can do is cry one to the other holy. Now, what is interesting to me is they're not crying faithful, faithful, faithful. Is God faithful? Yes, you better believe he's faithful. But that's not his attribute that stands out above all others. They're not crying love, love, love. Is God, he doesn't, he doesn't even have love. He is love but they're crying holy. This is the attribute of God. And you know what's also interesting to me is that the only description in the New Testament of the church that Jesus is coming back for is holy. 
It's not a leadership church. I believe in leadership. We've had to have leadership to do what we've been able to do at Messenger. You'd never get anything accomplished without leadership. But it's not a leadership-driven church. It's not a relevant church. You're not going to reach the lost if you're not relevant. It's not a community church. Even God himself said it's not good that man's alone. The only description of the church that Jesus is returning for is a holy bride without spot or wrinkle. So when you look at that, the most predominant attribute of God in the scripture and the most predominant attribute of the bride Jesus is coming back for, it's holy. I've got an I've got an intense hunger to know more about the holiness of God. Wow. Somebody got to text me an amen on that one. Wow. Well, you open the book of God by exploring the ups and downs of Solomon's life. And I just think that's an important place to start. So for context, for those maybe not fully familiar with his story, give us just an overview so we can see what we can learn from him. Well, I mean, and 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 this is really relevant to what we're talking about today, Susie, because the Bible says that holiness is perfected in the fear of the Lord. Mm-hmm. If you look at Solomon, he's raised by King David and his mother being Bathsheba. Of course, David and Bathsheba had a colossal failure, but they were forgiven by God. But they raised this young man in the fear of the Lord. And it was David who taught Solomon the fear of the Lord. And Solomon ends up, because the fear of the Lord is the starting place for wisdom and understanding, Solomon ends up developing this kingdom, or I should say, uh, leading this kingdom into one of the greatest kingdoms ever known on the planet Earth as far as efficiency. I mean, the Bible says that every family in Israel had a home and a garden. Think about it. You got a nation and nobody's renting an apartment. Nobody is, is, is without a place to live. When the Queen of Sheba came up and she traveled all that distance, she said, I heard such great things about you, but I, I, can't, I can't even begin to articulate the greatness and the systems. The, the, what you've set up here is mind-blowing. Now, here's Solomon who becomes so great, one of the greatest men to walk the earth because of the fear of God. Somehow, for some reason, he loses the fear of God in the midst of his success. And he begins to marry hundreds of wives. And I believe God gave us a gift. And that gift is called the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, there are two books that we ministers avoid in the Bible, the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a reason we avoid those books, because they're two inspired books written by two very uninspired men. (laughs) If you look at Ecclesiastes, Solomon has this attitude of what goes around comes around. Nothing new is under the sun. Everything we do in life is vain. He even makes a statement, the day you die is better than the day you're born. Now, who in the world writes statements (laughs) like these? Somebody who has got a very cynical and jaded outlook towards life. What brought him to that place of having a cynical outlook towards life was his loss of the holy fear of God. Susie, I have, unfortunately, you know, being in ministry over four decades, I have been in green rooms, and green rooms meaning the place you are before you go on the platform. You're there with the pastor, the conference leader. I have seen so much cynicism, jadedness. Mm. I've seen it in green rooms. And, the, and, and my heart breaks. And I really realize what causes a person to lose fire is their lack of the holy fear of God. When Solomon let the fear of God go, he went into cynicism. But if you look at the very end of his book, he recovers. And I love that God gave us a window into his life, seeing that he recovered. Because the very last chapter, he writes in one form or another, remember your creator seven times. And the very last words he writes in that book of Ecclesiastes is, hey, this is man's all to fear God and keep his commandments. In other words, he's saying this is what will give you a successful life. Hmm. If you 
We're going to go break here, at, but I get, okay. oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you look at Isaiah 11, 3, it's quite interesting. If you look at the contrast of Solomon, it's Jesus. Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord. And I would say to every one of our listeners, what Jesus, my Lord, delighted in, I want to delight in. And he delighted in yeah. the fear of the Lord. So good. We're going to pause. When we come back, I want to just touch on the idea where he was saying, you know, in a lamenting way, nothing new under the sun. I hear Christians quote that all the time, you know, because the Bible says it. But I'm like, that's actually not right. I mean, his mercies are new every morning. He makes all things new. When a person comes to Christ, they're a brand new creation. There's plenty new. You know, God himself says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Do you perceive it? I just want you to speak to that because I think so often we'll settle into things and stop looking for God's movement in our midst because we might read something out of context. Talking to John Bevere, best-selling author, minister of the gospel all over the world. He's got this amazing book. And last time he was on, when it first released, I said, I got to have you back because we just scratched the surface of the content of this book. And I think we're going to just scratch more of the surface today. It's the awe of God, the astounding way a healthy fear of God transforms your life. If you've got questions about what it looks like to fear God, to revere him, why don't you text me 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a moment. This is Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. You know, for 75 years, God has been changing lives through Faith Radio. To celebrate, you could win one of the 75 Faith Radio birthday boxes filled with Brant Hansen's new book, Life is Hard, God is Good, Let's Dance, and a new Faith Radio t-shirt and some other fun things to help you grow and commemorate this important birthday. You are an important part of the family. And on this special birthday, you get the presents. You can enter to win yours at MyFaithRadio.com. That's MyFaithRadio.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're talking to John Bevere today. He's best-selling author, international minister of the gospel. He's written an amazing book, and this is the second time we've talked about it, and I still feel like there's so much more in this book than we can cover in this one hour. The Awe of God is the title. The Astounding Way a Healthy Fear of God Transforms Your Life. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing. I've got a handful of copies to give away. Highly Highly recommend it. Text the word book to 877-933-2484. John, before we move on, there's so much content I want to cover, but I want to touch on this one point where you were talking about Solomon when he was in that place of cynicism, where he had drifted from the best of what God has. And some of the words he wrote in Ecclesiastes, I hear Christians quoting now as if they're gospel truth, like there's nothing new under the sun. But he was saying that in, in kind of a lament in a place of, of really not being in the best place with God. That's not true that there's nothing new under the sun. Babies are born, you know, on the hour. I'd love for you just to speak to that idea. Well, and, and exactly. When you lose the fear of God, you lose wisdom, you lose understanding, you lose counsel from the holy, the holy place. And what happens is you, you, your, your creativity goes down. Everything beautiful begins to diminish and dwindle. And this is what happened with mm -hmm. Solomon. And when people are quoting that, they don't realize this is actually something God gave us as an illustration to show you what happens when somebody departs from his wisdom, his creativity, his life. And so <clears throat> this is absolutely something I don't quote. That's not true. I mean, look at all that has happened in just the last hundred years. We have airline travel. We have that they never had before that. We have you know, telephones, we have the ability now to text and all these things. What, what is that? That's, that's, that's God given. That's God given, I believe, to help promote the kingdom of God in a much more rapid way in the last days so that we can reach the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If nothing new is under the sun, we never would have had any of the things I just mentioned. So there are statements made by people in the scripture that you always got to read in context if you don't yeah. read that in context, you're going to end up believing something that's actually contrary to what other portions of the scripture reveal. The Bible says, yeah, seek so and you shall find, knock and it will be open to you. This is the person, you show me a person who's negative, you show me a person that's 
down on life. And I'll show you a person whose mind is not renewed. And one of the reasons their mind is not renewed is because they have not embraced the healthy fear of God. Hmm, boy, so good. So good. Okay. In the scriptures, I mean, in your book, you reference Paul when he wrote the scripture, I buffet my body and make it my slave for fear of after preaching to others, I myself will be disqualified. And you heard my open where I've just been pondering so much more and more as we see leaders fall publicly. And there are plenty of people who don't have a public platform who are still trashing their families, walking away from a lifelong commitment, that kind of a thing. And I, you know, I do believe that the common denominator is either the fear of God or lack thereof. So talk about what Paul meant there when he says, I buffet my body, make it my slave for fear of after preaching to others, I myself will be disqualified. Well, this is something I've been addressing a lot with pastors. We have a pastors network where 8,000 pastors have signed up where we were going to do a Zoom call with them once a month. And I realized the reason they're signing up is they also are saying, why are so many of our fellow pastors falling? Why are so many of our fellow pastors leaving the ministry? It's because as leaders, we have to realize we have a personal walk with Jesus and we have a public walk. And a lot of times the public life walk consumes the personal walk. When I'm writing a book, I, I got to make sure I get up in the morning and I'm reading the Bible for the Holy Spirit to speak to me, that I'm praying uh, uh, personally. And I find that what happens with leaders is they're so busy so busy ministering, so busy preparing their sermon for this su Sunday, what happens is their personal walk begins to dwindle. And I believe that's what Paul is saying, is I'm going to make sure that I finish this race well. An athlete trains so they finish the race well. I'm going to train spiritually because physical exercise profits little. Godliness is profitable for all things. He's actually comparing Godliness, the exercise of godliness as being a very important component in our personal life. I have a personal ministry goal. People have asked me, what, what is it? And I say, it's very simple. I want to be more passionately in love with Jesus the day I leave this earth than the day I began ministry. That is my number one ministry goal because I've seen too many. I've had my our first three pastors, Lisa and I, all three of our first pastors had internationally known ministries, not just nationally, internationally. Two of them aren't in ministry any longer. What mm. happened? It was because that personal walk got consumed by what they were doing. And we haven't even addressed what the fear of the Lord is. I want to make sure your listeners understand the fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God. It's actually more about being terrified of being away from God. If you want to define, because let, let me say this to all your listeners, God's number one desire is to be intimate with every one of us. He's more passionate about it being intimate with you and I than we are being intimate with him. So how can you be intimate with somebody you're afraid of? It's impossible. So the fear of the Lord is actually when we it, it's a it's a term used in scripture of when we stand in awe of him, we tremble in a healthy way before him. We come before him almost like Esther would come before her king. Now, I'm not saying God is anything like the king of Persia, but I'm saying that she realized, hey, I'm married to this man. I'm intimate with this man, but this man is also ruler of the world right now, which God gave him that ability. He had a kingdom that ruled the nations of the world. So she realized there, there, there are incidences when I'm going to approach him, and I'm approaching him as king right now, not as husband. And I believe this is why the New Testament tells us God is our Abba Father, but he also tells us in the New Testament that he is the consuming fire. That's why we're to have grace, whereby we can serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So, the fear of the Lord actually brings us closer to him and creates a more intimate relationship with him. And so that's so important that I bring that up. But when you when you yeah. talk about leaving the faith, you talk about, do you, do you know that Barna did an in-depth study? Over 30 million Americans have walked away from the faith in the last 24 years. Over 30 million not only walked away from the faith, a good percentage of them now are professing agnostics, atheists, and spiritualists. Let me tell you, Susie, I was in the nation of Malaysia back in 1999, and it was a nationwide conference. The auditorium was filled, and the presence 
of the of God came in such a way that it was the holy fear of God. It put that in all of us. I remember in that building, I am standing in this presence and I'm trembling. I'm actually, and I, your, your listeners are going to raise their eyebrows. I'm terrified, yet I'm drawn to it. It's the most weird thing. You, I had never experienced a presence like that, an authority. And it lasted about six minutes. And I remember when that presence lifted the entire auditorium, I mean, literally packed auditorium. You, people are on the floor weeping. You could hear the sobs. I, I'm frozen. I remember I thought during that presence, John, if you say one wrong word and make a wrong move, you're dead possibly. Now, would that have happened? I don't know. But Ananias and Sapphira came into that presence of God with irreverence in Acts chapter 5, and they buried them both that day. So I'll just leave that one alone for now. Yeah. Right. I remember when I'm walking out of that pla- uh, that that auditorium, uh, the, the the leader was so wise. He said, "Hey, we're not ending this service. You just stay as long as you want." And I I'm walking out, and I remember there was a couple from India. They were in the Bible school in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and I had noticed that they got really impacted by that presence. And we're just looking at each other. I mean, what do you say? When Isaiah saw the Lord, he didn't go, dude, there he is. He was on his face saying, I'm undone. Woe is me. That's kind of the way we were feeling, right? But yet we were so drawn to that presence and so refreshed by his presence. I'm walking out and we're just staring at each other and not saying anything. Finally, she, the wife, breaks the silence and she goes, I feel so clean right now. And I said, that's it. That's it. That's exactly what I feel as well. And I remember going back to my hotel room that night thinking, wow, clean. I feel clean. Well, the next morning I was getting ready to go out of my hotel room and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, read Psalm 19. And I had no idea, Susie, what I'm going to read. And this is 1999, so I didn't have an iPad. So I grabbed my Bible. I opened up Psalm 19 and I get down to verse 9. And I read this, this, the fear of the Lord is clean. Wow. And I went, oh, wow, there it is. And then the next statement was this, enduring forever. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that hotel room. And he said, son, Lucifer led worship right before my throne. He was anointed to do so. He beheld my glory. He did not fear me. He didn't endure forever. He said, a third of the angels surrounded my throne. They beheld my glory. They did not fear me. They didn't endure forever. He said, Adam and Eve walked in the presence of my glory. They didn't fear me. They didn't endure in the garden forever. He said, every created being that surrounds my throne will be tested in the holy fear of God. Now, why have 30 million Americans walked away from the faith? Why have we lost why, what, here's, here's a statistic they just came out with last year. Only 50% of the pastors are going to endure more than five years. 50%. Why are we seeing people leave so much? I believe it's because we're not emphasizing the healthy, holy fear of God. Because, again, we are told in Isaiah 33, verse 6, it is God's treasure. I believe it's his treasured gift that he gives to us that keeps us from falling or slipping away, from going shipwrecked, from burning out, from blowing up, from becoming disinterested. It keeps us in a flesh that becomes tired of a new car. It becomes tired of a new house. It becomes tired of a certain scene. That's the way flesh is. Things get old to flesh. The fear of the Lord keeps us in touch with our reborn spirit that's made in the image and likeness of Jesus and keeps us more hungry after four decades of ministry than when we were when we started ministry. See, Susie, you walk in the fear of the Lord. This is why you've been so so drawn to this is because, you know, I remember just a couple decades ago being the first time I talked to you on a radio. I think Beta Satan was the first one. It was at least a couple decades Mm -hmm. ago. Here you are today, so in love with people, so passionate about Jesus and truth. Why? I believe you walk in the fear of the Lord. 
And you know what? You're one of the kindest people I know. So if you got an image of a legalist that says, oh, I fear God, that's why I hate those sinners. That's not the fear of God, because the fear of God is when we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. God loves those, quote, sinners so much that he sent Jesus to die for them. So you don't fear God when you act like that because you love you hate what he loves. What God hates is the sin that unmakes the objects of his love. We, every human being, Jesus died for the whole world. We're the object of his love. What he hates is the sin that unmakes us, that degrades us, that brings us down to a level far below what he created us to walk in. Sorry, I just I got want to get on my knees. Are you kidding me? I just, uh, this is a time where it's not convenient to be a live radio host. <laughs> because if I was just listening, I'd push pause and go get on my knees right now. I, how are you feeling, friends? Text me and let me know how God is speaking to you, because he sure is speaking to me. And as you're talking, John, I'm thinking of how many instances in Scripture when the manifest presence of God was made known, or even an angelic visit, like at the tomb with the two Marys, you know, the, this angel that carried a measure of the presence of God, enough where there was glory on him, and the earth shook and responded. Every single time there was a manifest presence, these people became undone. All of them went face down. Not one stood there and said, like you said, dude, this is, you know, Peter started that way. Let's build, <laughs> let's build an altar, whatever. But, you know, he said, this is my son. Listen to him. And then Peter went down. How can we think for a moment, if we really, really knew who God was, that we would even remain standing? I mean, truly, I, uh, you said this years and years ago, and I referenced it when I talked with Lisa last week, and I don't remember how you said, but I said, why don't we see the kind of miracles in the West that, that we see in, first, in the third world countries? And you said that, that we've lost our reverence. And when there's no reverence, there's no manifest presence. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you said, but before we go to break, is there anything you want to clarify or add to what I just said? No, I love what you just said. I, I, I say yes and amen. Oh, wow. All right, we're going to take a break here. When we come back, we'll talk more about what does that mean in this day when there is such a, an apostate, um, apostasy going around? Uh, all of us, everywhere you turn, you see people thumbing their nose at God. And even Christians who casually say, I'm not speaking to God, I'm mad at him right now. And I like to say this with great love, but that shows, I think, uh, immaturity and a need for growth and humility and teachability. But I'd love to know from you, how is this resonating? I have so many people saying, amen, amen. Yes, this giving me goosebumps. I want so much for us to walk in his presence as we live here on earth. That's my life for Psalm 116.9. Talking to John Bevere, more with him in a moment. You're having a really great day. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, talking to best selling author, international minister of the gospel, John Bevere, about his amazing book, The Awe of God, the astounding way a healthy fear of God transforms your life. And I want you to kind of compare it to a, a child who's in an abusive home and their father is given to just fits of anger. So he just never knows when he's going to blow. So he lives in that posture bracing for impact. And then you've got John with his four sons or Kevin and I with our three sons, and they had a healthy fear of their dad. They loved him. They bantered. They, you know, wrestled with him. But when Kev put his foot down, and I'm sure, John, when you put your foot down, your boys knew you meant business. It was a healthy reverence and respect. So with that picture in mind, I want to read these excerpts from John's book. What if fear, rightly aimed, is a virtue? What if the fear of God is the paradoxical path to an authentic relationship with him? What if this holy fear is what truly opens us up to the fullness of life that Jesus followers have experienced throughout the centuries? What if this fear eradicates all other fears? Someone who's scared of God has something to hide. However, the person who fears God has nothing to hide. He or she's terrified of being away from God. God wants to be close and intimate with you. So rest assured, Holy fear does not quench intimacy. It does just the opposite. It enhances our interaction with God. John, I would love a couple more stories from your history of just times when God surprised you. I mean, you've told different stories in the past of, you know, 
before or after speaking event and God meeting you in the hotel room or in your car, you know, whatever, when he brought a revelation that just made you kind of quake, can you think of anything, anything come to mind? Well, you know, Susie, when you do have a, an encounter with the Lord, you, you're never the, ever the same. I find those encounters sometimes come with a whisper with all of a sudden an illuminating thought that you never could have had in your life on your own. You're just like, oh, I never could have thought of that on my own. And you realize God had revealed something to you. I think I think what what I would like to to point to is I kind of opened up with this and I, w- I want to go back to it again. Um, I I look at I look at the reason we look at holiness as dull or as scary is because of the way it's been represented. To be holy means you're set apart. And if you look at if you look at a husband and a wife, you know, the New Testament talks about our position of holiness and it talks about our behavior of holiness. If you look at Lisa and I got married 42 years ago and when we got married, she became my wife. And she's not more my wife today, 42 years later, than she was the day I married her. She took the position of my wife. Now, and and I'm going to answer your question with what I'm saying, but let me get there. Once we got married, she took a behavior that aligned with her position. Before we got married, she went out on dates with other guys. She gave them their phone numbers. She flirted with guys. After she got married, she didn't go out with other guys. She didn't give them their phone numbers. She had a behavior that matched her position. I could have looked at Lisa during our marriage and held up our marriage certificate and said, look, we are technically married. And I would have been correct. But if I was sleeping with other women, I may have technically been married to her, but I would have lost something very valuable. I would have lost those times when her her head and my head's on the pillow and she says something to me from the deepest places of her heart that she doesn't she's never shared with anybody else. I would lose that beautiful intimacy. The reason I don't commit adultery against my wife. Well, number one, I fear God. Number two, she'd probably she'd probably I'd probably be (laughs) dead. She's a sharpshooter. (laughs) I don't want to lose those times of intimacy where she whispers something to me that she wouldn't tell anybody else. Hmm. The reason I don't want to commit adultery against God, and James says it, he says to believers, you're seeking a relationship with the world. You are an adulterer and you have positioned yourself to be at enmity with God. So what you lose is that intimacy. So when I look at Hebrews 12, 14, pursue holiness, pursue means chase after with the intent to apprehend. It means to do it with intensity and urgency. Lisa is not chasing after being my wife. Can you imagine Lisa going to a prayer meeting and saying, girls, just pray. I am chasing after with the intent to apprehend being John Bevere's wife. They'd all laugh at her and said, you already are John Bevere's wife. Now, if she would say to them, girls, pray for me. I am chasing after with intensity to be the behavior of being a better wife to John. They would understand that. So when the Bible says pursue holiness, it's saying chase after the behavior that would create intimacy with God, because it says without holiness, no man's going to see the Lord. Now, Susie, we know Revelations 1, 7 says, behold, every eye will see him. He comes in the clouds. Even those who pierced him will see him. So every eye is going to see him. What's it talking about? No one will see the Lord. Well, I've been under what? I think 13 United States presidents. Their decisions affect my life. I'm under their rulership, but I've never been in the presence of a United States president. I've never seen one, been in their presence. There are other citizens. They work with the president every day. They're, they see him every day. They're in his presence every day. There are Christians. They're under the lordship of Jesus. His decisions affect their lives, but they're not enjoying that intimacy because why? They're not chasing after holiness. Now, what perfects holiness? Paul tells us the fear of the Lord. 
Paul tells us, by the fear of the, the Lord, one departs from evil. I had a minister who actually went to jail. And while he was in jail, he told me, John, I love Jesus the whole time. I was doing what I was doing that got me arrested and thrown into prison. He said, I loved him all the way through it. He said, I didn't fear God. And so, Susie, when we walk in the fear of God, it keeps us from the sin that separates us from God. And now all of a sudden, he starts whispering things to us. So my life has been so radically changed. I mean, people, people say to me, you know, I've written 24 books now. People say, where do you get these books from? It's that intimacy factor. So the reason I don't want to commit adultery against God is because I don't ever want to lose when he whispers those things into my heart that I've never known before. So yes, I believe there is a place that God has called every single one of us to where we are so intimate with him, we would rather have our heads cut off before losing that intimacy. And I quite frankly believe this is why 30 million people have walked away from the faith. They've never experienced that intimacy. I mean, if you look at people, they they rape, they, they, they look at pornography. Why do they do that? Because they've never experienced the intimacy that you and I have with our spouses. I look at committing adultery. I go, why in the world would I ever want to do that and lose this amazing intimacy that I have with my wife? Well, that's the same way with our walk with Jesus. So Jesus being the groom and we being the bride, if you look at the scripture, it says, a man shall leave his father and mother be joined to his wife. The two shall become one. He said, this is a great mystery, but it's an, actually an illustration of the way the church and Jesus are one. So God doesn't ask any more of us than what a spouse would ask. They would say, you know what? Just give me your heart. I don't care if you make mistakes. I don't care if you make goof ups. Just I want I want your heart. I want your full faithfulness. The fear of the Lord is what brings us that faithfulness in our relationship with God. It's what keeps us in that place of humility that we can keep receiving from from him where he dwells. And so this is why it's a treasure. This is why Jesus delighted in it. It's because it is the very doorway into an intimate relationship with God. That's why the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the starting place of knowing God intimately. Hmm. So good. As we go to break, I'm thinking of two quotes from Dr. Rob Reamer, who joins us once a month. He says, Jesus has millions of Facebook friends, but very few face-to-face -face friends. And he says, you can have as much of God as you want, but not more than you're willing to pay the price for. Like he said, there's some point we want to progress beyond a devotional diet, where we actually create more space to meet with God, to encounter God, to know God. And I just think that fits so well with what we're talking about today, the awe of God. John Bevere is my guest. And when we come back with a few minutes we have left, I want you to talk about the judgment seat. You referenced the passage of 2 Corinthians 5. 10. It's something that I think about constantly, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we've done in this earthly body. I'll have John unpack that on the other side. Thanks so much for tuning in. I pray you're as encouraged and inspired as I am. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, I'm Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. And one of the things I love about Faith Radio is that we put a high priority on the Word of God. The Word of God is living, active, and powerful. There's no other book that you can open up and hear the voice of God like the Word of God. We would love for you to join us this Lenten season. Prepare your heart for Easter and study the scriptures with us as we walk with Jesus to the cross You'll feel like you're right there watching it all happen. And then you'll be the first to celebrate Easter morning with a better understanding. You can sign up on our website to receive a free study guide. Subscribe to the daily Reading the Bible Together podcast to listen to the podcasts that accompany this Reading the Bible Together initiative. I hope you'll join us. You'll find all the information that you need on MyFaithRadio.com. Hope you're having a really great day. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, having a just a 
powerful conversation with our friend John Bevere. He's a best-selling author, international minister of the gospel. And this book came out a little bit ago. It came out, we actually covered it when it came out, but I told him, please come back because we just scratched the surface of this great book, The Awe of God, The Astounding Way a Healthy Fear of God Transforms Your Life. And John writes like he speaks. So you're going to love this book. Got a handful of copies to give away. You can text the word book to 877-933-933. 2484. I just, with our few minutes left, I'd love to talk about just to clear up maybe confusion that some have about the judgment seat. Um, some I've heard say that they think that's only for unbelievers, but it's really clear that there's the great white throne of judgment and then the judgment seat. Before I have you dig in, did you write a novel on this years ago? Edge of I did. I actually wrote a novel and a nonfiction book. The nonfiction book was called Driven by Eternity. The fiction book was called, and I did it with Bethany there in Minneapolis. Uh, it was called Rescued. And the the really point good. of both being to show, well, Driven by Attorney showed people that, hey, there is a believer's judgment and there is an unbeliever's judgment. And I think when you look at what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, it just makes it so crystal clear. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says in verse 8, he said, um, let me see, let me find it here. He said, Yes, we are fully confident that we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we would be at home with the Lord. So he's clearly talking about Christians here because when a non-Christian is away from the body, they're not in the presence of the Lord. He said, so whether we are in this body or out of the body, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him for, so here's the next statement, because we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us, speaking about believers, will receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, this is Paul's words to the Corinthians. So what he's saying is, it's going to be like the celestial award ceremony, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where actually God is going to say to his servants, thank you for your faithfulness to me. And he's going to reward eternally what we did on this earth for him in obedience to him. So if we're called to be a stay-at-home mom that intercedes and prays for our church and our neighborhood and our city, and we do that, we'll be rewarded just as greatly as a man like Billy Graham who won so many to Christ because God rewards according to what he's called us to do. And what I think is amazing is the word judgment really terrifies people uh, it's the Greek word krema, which simply means a decision resulting from an investigation. So they're called eternal re- judgments. So let's let's simplify that, eternal decisions. So in other words, think about this. Our life, we have all this creativity, all this innovation going on, all this building going on. Do we possibly think that heaven that birthed this earth is going to be more boring than earth. No, heaven's going to be having construction going on. It's going to be having a planning and all this stuff. And and there's going to be positions. I mean, there's going to be positions of overseeing 10 communities or five communities, or maybe this particular planet's going to be developed. I believe there's going to be people that are going to be ruling and reigning close to Jesus. And the Bible shows this because they were faithful to him in this earth time. And they're going to be rewarded with positions in eternity of, I think, greater responsibility because they showed themselves to be servants and humble and obedient to him here on this earth. And so I like to say it like this, what we do with the cross, yes, it determines where we're going to spend eternity. You can never, ever Live good enough to earn salvation. Salvation is a free gift. It is God's gift of grace. So what we do with the cross does determine where we're going to spend eternity, heaven or hell. However, the way we live as believers determines how we're going to spend eternity. Think about it. Think about if you live for one day and you were told the way you live over the next 24 hours will determine how you live on this earth for the next thousand years. The job you do, the people you work with, the neighborhood you live in, the city you live in will be be determined for the next thousand years by how you live the next 24 hours. We would all live it with purpose, correct? Well, this is nothing compared to eternity. 
Because 80 years, if you compare 80 years to eternity, you get a vapor, you get zero. What we do in this vapor time determines how we're going to spend eternity. That's why I want to live with purpose. That's what Paul meant going back to your original question. I buffet my body. I train it like an athlete because I want to finish well. There's a crown laid up for me. There's a reward laid up for me. That reward is an eternal reward. There will never be any changes, any revisions, any alterations. It will stand forever and ever and ever. I just know that in this very short time in this life, I want to live with purpose. I want to live to build his kingdom, to glorify him, not me. I want to glorify him. And the way we glorify him is by impacting other people's lives, whether it's the kind words we speak to them, whether it's the kind deeds we do for them, whether it's helping them in great times of need, praying for them and believing God to bring what we, is needed. In we got to go. We're coming up to the hard break, John. We love you. This was awesome. Thank you, friends, for tuning in today. I know you were encouraged by the texts that are coming in. We love you. Keep walking with them. Have a great day. We'll meet you back here next time. Thanks for listening to Suzy Larson Live. Podcasts like mine are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes and give now.